Welcome to the Fail Forward podcast. The purpose of this podcast is change the negative stigma around failure into a positive. Failure is only a negative if we do not learn from it and we give up. Welcome back to the Fail Forward podcast. Today, I've got Alexis Kingsbury sorry, with me today. Alexis, I actually met a year ago now at Expert Empires for the first time, and we talked about this podcast episode. So this is this has been a year in the making, but actually we're a year in the making of this whole podcast of Fell Forward. So it's a great time to have Alexis on. Um, and one of the things that um, Alexis is, he is the king of systems. He's a serial entrepreneur. He's um, a speaker as well. Um, and one of the reasons why systems is so important is because, as you guys know, I talk about the four pillars of a business, um, which actually I've now changed to five pillars, but I'll go more into that um, on another podcast episode. But the fifth pillar now is mindset because you can do all of this strategy and tactics and everything stuff, but if you've not got the right right mindset, then the whole lot's not gonna come together. So the five pillars, just to remind everybody, are mindset, numbers, sales and marketing, systems and culture. Now I'm gonna be really honest with everyone, systems, isn't my strong point. And that's why I'm really happy to have Alexis on to talk about systems and talk about his businesses. So welcome, Alexis, how are you doing? Yeah, it's fantastic to be here. I'm glad that we managed to uh, to set it up. Uh, and yeah, I'm raring to go, excited to talk about systems and how people can use them in their business in a non-boring way, because I appreciate for a lot of business owners, systems is not why they got into uh, building their businesses, right? Um, they want to deliver an impact. They want to create a, a life that they're excited by, uh, that they get to time with the people that they want to spend time with. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm excited to share uh, some yeah very practical approaches to systems that help you do that really quickly. You're exactly right because most people, most business owners are like, you know, we're, we're, we're on the hit all the time to get the next rush of the next sale or the next customer or the next whatever. And, you know, most business owners have just want that constant excitement. And actually some people look at systems and go, well, that's boring. But what I've learned is that systems is actually what buys me the time to do the exciting stuff. So systems like the glue that glues everything together, isn't it? So we can buy that time to have the excitement. Spot on. I'd say that um, in fact, like diving in, uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting for, for essentially business owners, entrepreneurs, is that to some extent, you've only really got two like jobs or, or like states that you need to switch between. One is working out what works. So for example, like working out what's the product offering that we need or service offering that we need to provide. How should we describe that to clients? How do we even reach our ideal clients? How do we then have a sales conversation, ask them the right questions that means that they decide that they're going to sign up and at what price? All of those things at some point you've had to work out in your business or are in the process of working out. The problem is that if you stay in always just working out new stuff and doing everything yourself, you run out of time to do more of it. And so you kind of need to switch to the, the second step or the net or the other state, which is then systemize it so that it happens regardless. Like, for example, if you've worked out the right way to sell, you need that to happen on the regular with your, t- you know, whether it's building a team to do it, whether it's putting in the automations or even just making it more efficient for when you do it so that you're not going to do loads of follow up and so on so that that happens consistently even when you're taking your mind elsewhere and now working on marketing or now working on an issue on delivery or sorting out cash flow or whatever it is, you need those things to happen. And I think that's the key is be- as being able as a business leader to switch from working out what works to systemizing it so that it continues to work even when you're moving on to other stuff. Yeah, and then you can concentrate on the exciting stuff. The sale, the sale, the sale, whatever it, whatever it is, it's the, it's the glue. I always use McDonald's. McDonald's is so systemized, isn't it? It's the reason why we, you know, people go back because they've got the consistency. They know they're going to get the same amount of ketchup and two gherkins and the salt on the chips and everyone, customers buy for the certainty. But then it's, it's also a scalable model once you've got those systems in place, isn't it? Yeah, exactly right. And in fact, um, there's a fantastic uh, author, uh, Marianne Page, who um, has literally written books on the model that McDonald's uses in businesses and how others uh, can can do that based on her, um, I think, like 20 years working in various parts of McDonald's. Uh, in fact, there's um, uh, the reason I, I, I know in depth around like this is because I've got an episode of my podcast, De-Stress Your Business, that we uh, that I interview her about that and, and we kind of go deep into, into doing those things. But I think, as you say, like that approach to building a business, that uh, um, systemization of all the various parts, you know, the way that I remember Marianne describing it is like, what's the one right way to do something? 
and it's it's the key is in my, in McDonald's there is one right way to do every part of that and not just the stuff that we think about when we think about McDonald's the flipping of the burgers the you know the frying of the fries and so on but even the manager training <laughs> like that's often something that most businesses if you said oh what does your manager training program look like most business owners would look at you blankly <laughs> it's like well manager training is you do a good job and then you become a manager um where whereas you know if you take mcdonald's as an example there are five levels of management training and you know, and you literally get stars in your badge for it right like it is clear on exactly what that's going to look like and imagine what that does for your business when you're clear on the journey that you're taking your team members through, the guidance that you're giving them, even right down to the training that you're giving managers. When you have worked out what works, like done that first step, when you've worked out what works and then systemized it so that it happens always that way, that one right, uh, right way. Yeah, I, I love that. And and as you said at the beginning, some people might not see systems as that exciting, sexy thing that's going to, you know, a lot of people will go and focus on the sales and marketing, but actually the systems is the thing that it, it, it create, creates a continuity. It works with everything and saves, like, you know, as you always talk about, you save people thousands of hours of time. So let's now talk about, so let's just go right back. And I know you've got um, Air Manual, you've got Spider Gap, and you've got bridging insights so they're your businesses but how did you get to that point where did your business journey start and 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 how did you get into this world yeah sure so i've always been an entrepreneurial kid so when i was like in my early teens i was washing cars and selling newsletters and building uh, a playstation fan site and all these sorts of things like i loved building things and seeing if i could turn it into making money essentially um and i really really enjoyed that but I could never work out how to grow the business past just me. And so at the time, I used to think that it was the business model. It was that it was a fundamentally unscalable business. And so I would close that and do another thing, particularly because as a classic entrepreneur, it was always I was interested in the shiny, the doing the new thing. And if I wasn't growing, if I was just turning it over, I wasn't interested. And so I kept on moving on. And so um, in that vein of trying to learn, how do I build a business that can grow and can do amazing things without me and that I can move on to the next shiny? Um, uh, one of the things that I did, I, I studied management science at university to learn how does big business work. I became management consultant uh, based in London, working with companies like AstraZeneca and Honda and BP, helping them to improve how they worked in their businesses, helping them improve their efficiency and so on. And it was, it was really there that I started to appreciate process um, compa uh, combined with people like if an organization can can just about get by if it has really great people and still has poor processes or non-existent like documented processes because you've got fantastic people often highly paid people uh, or indeed the business owner themselves who's bringing all that creativity and doing the doing and pulling their um, you know really heart into it every single day and so you can get there the problem is as soon as they're not available or they leave or you have to have a change of staff or whatever, even they go on holiday or sick, you've suddenly got a problem. So on the flip side, you can have a business that can do pretty well if it's got great processes and weak people. Because, yes, you've got weak people, but at least if they follow the process, they should do a fairly good job. And, if, you know, McDonald's might be an example where we might think, oh, well, they're not they're not trying to seek the best talent in the world to flip those burgers. Of course, there are basic levels of skills that they're looking for. But by having awesome processes, they're able to get repeatable results anyway. And what I saw when I was working as a consultant is when you bring awesome people and awesome processes together, then magic really happens. Because suddenly you've got people who are bringing their creativity and expertise, but are able to not spend a load of time on the on the basic stuff, like they're able to move quickly through the process. And as a result, focus on the on the adding value area. And so that was kind of the starting point for me of that this kind of excitement around how do you use systems and processes to increase impact and allow people to do more of what they love and and uh, that adds value but around then i decided with uh, i met uh, another consultant that works at the same company as as me uh, but it was on the software development side and we both it turned out over uh, beers and so on it turned out that we both wanted to set up software businesses at some point and uh, decided again over beers uh, that we would uh, leave the consultancy and uh, go and start our own to give us the time and the money to build the software business and honestly we thought it would take us maybe a year or two to get the software business earning enough that it would cover us it took way longer than that i think it ended up taking about 
five years before we got to that point. And so the consulting in the background really got us through, right? Me, essentially, largely me, uh, my business partner initially did some consulting, but um, after a, a year, I think about a year and a half, we basically had him 100% working on our first software business together, which was Spider Gap, which is a uh, online 360 feedback tool. So essentially for employee development. Um, and so, you know, he was developing that. I was doing consulting, working with a variety of clients, including uh, Sony and IMI PLC and various other organizations, helping them to improve how their teams were working together and collaborating. So I've had loads of experience of helping other people's businesses on like building them and yet felt a bit of a fraud, frankly, because I hadn't been able to do it for my, for my own. And it was only after it was around sort of 2017 when we started to when you know we'd grown it enough we've got enough critical mass and and so on i was like right finally i think it's time that we're going to hire and it was then that we started to make firstly make mistakes around hiring like bringing people in but not giving them the processes and the guidance um uh, that uh, we started to make those mistakes and learned how do you build a business that combines great people and great processes and suddenly when that when those things came together suddenly our growth rocketed and we grew uh, grew that then to a seven figure business we got to a point where Paddy and I are now no longer operationally required in um, uh, in Spider Gap. Uh, we have a COO that runs it with the with the rest of the team. So there's a team of ten there um, that uh, you know we're not we're not required day to day, and that's freed us up to start on our next shiny, <laughs> which is uh, uh, Air Manual, um, which we started at the end of 2020, start of 2021. Um, Can which I just is take this... you back quickly? Take you back. We'll we'll get onto Air Manual in a minute. So. Uh, just a quick question that came up with this because because it does happen and I've had this before when there's six stressful things going in, on in my business and then I'm mentoring other people and you sort of mentioned sometimes that gave you a bit of a, a, a feeling how was that was that a bit of a kind of almost imposter syndrome kind of coming out yeah and it's I mean it's something that I think all of us experience at some point in our careers that sense of imposter syndrome syndrome whether it's the first like you know when you win an award or when you're asked to speak at something or uh, or even when you're you know doing a sales pitch to a big company or whatever like those things come out um i had a big case of it when i first did my first ever consulting project when i was uh, working back at that london based consulting firm um i remember uh thinking I'm being charged out at 960 pounds per day and I'm at the time I felt like I was basically straight out of uni you know I'd had a bit of training and I'd uh, done some cool stuff around um, my study but I, I still felt a little bit like I'm just a grad like how am I going to be able to add value to other people um, and I remember on that very first day thinking not only have I got to add 960 pounds of value today um, but if I don't then tomorrow it's double and day three, it's triple. <laughs> so I'm like, this will, this will accumulate. And so um, I remember one of the first jobs I was asked to do was um, we're documenting these these processes. Um, it's relating to finance processes. Documenting these finance processes. We need you to sit and watch what this person does. We'll call her Janet. You need to sit with Janet watch what she does and document it and turn it into essentially a, a flow chart of steps so that we can you know then uh, either improve it or at least document it so that it's all done the consistent way um in fact yeah it was, it, in this case it was just getting it consistent and what was amazing was um so i sat down with her and started like asking some you know she'd do it on the computer and i was following along occasionally asking questions just to clarify my understanding and i remember at one point she had the spreadsheet open and she was entering in these formulae um, in each of the rows and i said well why don't why don't you why aren't you just copying that down and she said oh because if you you know so much stupid like you know young consultant you can't just copy it down because i need the cell reference to change for each formula as it goes down i was like yeah but you can do copy cells and it'll automatically change that as you drag down and i so said i'm like do you mind if i show you and i showed her and basically demonstrated how three de hours per day <laughs> could be could, could be saved through one use of very basic Excel functionality. And I was kind of like sitting there going, well, that's my 960 pounds for today. <laughs> and, and so, and, and I think I, I share that example because I had imposter syndrome there 
completely justifiably in many ways, right? That's that's someone who's coming to a business, working with someone who had had probably 10, 15 years in that role. She'd been working in, in finance and doing a variety of acti acti activities. This was just one. And yet I was able to add value. Why? Because I'd had a slightly different set of experiences to her. And it's the ability, the ability to add like even just a second set of eyes on a problem or to, or to shine a spotlight on a problem. I'm continually amazed by just discussing a problem that previously might have been glossed over, asking a question. You know, you'll have had this. Just asking the right question, even if it seems like a silly question, can sometimes unlock so much value. And so I think I use that a lot when I, you know, when, when I'm sort of, that feeling, that sense of imposter syndrome is just remembering that you're just coming from a slightly different perspective or even worst case scenario, you're surrounded by everyone who has got more brain cells and expertise than you have, in which case your job is to ask the questions that allow them to shine. And I think yeah, I've, I've had that come up numerous times, but you know, the other example, as I say, was when I was still doing consulting, which I'd still like about at that point, you know, when I was first doing consulting, I hadn't even gone out and restarted a consulting business, software business and so on. But yeah, when I when I was finding that hard, it um, it did feel a bit like, oh, well, you know, how could I possibly tell other people how to run their businesses? But of course, the reality is I wasn't telling them how to run every aspect of it. I was helping them fix some of the bits that I could provide insight on. So, yeah, it's a it's an interesting challenge, that old imposter, imposter syndrome. It is. I had it when I first become a property mentor for Progressive Property. I'd only been doing property two years and they, they said, do you want to come and be a mentor? And I remember every time I'd sit down at this table of eight people on a mastermind looking at me going, answer my questions. And I have this fear at the beginning of the day of like, how am I going to serve these people best? But then by the end of the day, like we're almost all high fiving each other. And it's just sometimes it's giving people a different perspective. And I get it all the time when I'm mentoring people on, on my tree surgery mastermind where I'm um, just asking, as you say, really good questions. And sometimes it is just a different perspective and I get it in my business and it's why I have mentors. It's why we have mentors and we're part of masterminds because sometimes the thing that's right in front of your face, you can't quite see. And someone just comes in and goes, have you tried that? And you're like, yeah, I know this. Why am I not doing that? You know, and it just sometimes needs needs that different angle just to highlight that, you know, that, that, that oh, you can just drag and drop that. And it's like those sometimes the easiest things, but the, the bringing of value and the different experiences, as you say, is 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 bang on. So so talking about um, Spider Gap, explain what does that do? Yeah, so that's a tool for that essentially supports employee development. So uh, within an organisation, let's say that you want to you want to support your team in uh, planning and prioritising their own personal development. You know, do they need to work on their communication skills? Do they need to work on their time management? Do they need to work on delegation? Variety of areas that they might be able to work on, but how do you prioritise? And so. What SpiderGap provides is a 360 degree feedback tool. That essentially means that you collect feedback from an employee's manager, uh, the, some of their peers, themselves, and then any direct reports they've got to build up a summary sort of aggregated report that makes it really easy for them to identify what are the strengths that I need to play to more and use more? What are the areas that the gaps that I most need to improve? And as a result, a kind of um, coach through the through our spider get report to get to a point where they actually come up with a, a plan that they can discuss and agree with the manager and it means that the manager can have much more efficient um, productive development conversation with their with their teams um, without having to have eyes and ears everywhere <laughs> all the time um, which is particularly important as teams become more you know uh, spread all over the place, remote, hybrid, whatever, like being able to gather that feedback from a variety of people is really, really powerful to then kind of support that coaching. So so that's what we created in, in SpiderGap. And now that's used uh, all around the world by over 550 organizations, including well-known brands like 3M, Pepsi, Swarovski, uh, Ocado, all sorts of uh, different great companies uh, and smaller ones too. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, sort of uh, grown, uh, grow slowly, really early on while we were still pivoting and, uh, working out what works. And then once we've got that systemized, it's been, uh, it's been growing really, uh, really, really well. Yeah. And you said at the, uh, at the beginning, you sort of made lots of mistakes. Um, and as you know, within theme of this podcast being fail forward, would you say there were the mistakes were little failures that you just then, you know, what's your take on failure? Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Like each, 
uh, each massive leap I've made in my progress, in my success and so on has normally come from a failure. So, um, you know, I made uh, one significant failure I made when we were hiring like that, which was um, a real key point that I mentioned earlier, where it was like we moved from a phase of really tough grind at Spider Gap to suddenly growing. Um, just before that happened, we one of the things that we did was hire a salesperson. So we got to a point where I was like, OK, I think we're getting enough sales and enough leads. I think we can support a salesperson and I'm completely stacked that I can't grow it any further if um, if we don't. So we said, great, well, let's do this properly. You know, we read the books. We knew that, you know, sometimes it's a who problem. You need the right person in your organization at the right time to really take you forward. So we said, well, we're not going to skim. You know, we'll, we'll go for a, a really good um, experienced salesperson. So we hired someone, you know, cast the net wide, did a proper recruitment process and so on. And we um, hired someone who had got experience of selling H, a similar sort of HR software uh, to us and had done a million pounds worth of sales revenue in the previous 12 months um, for this other company. So we're like, fantastic, like come into our business. We've got a better product than them anyway. So like you'll imagine what you'll do with us. And so we brought him in. And of course, you don't find out the results in days. Like it takes months before a salesperson's kind of whether you're even able to look at enough data to make a decision. And what it became clear is that not only was he not hitting million pound revenues, it wasn't uh, exceeding what I had been doing when I had been selling. And what we realized is we hadn't given him the sales process, the guidance, the onboarding, the training so that he could do a good job. We had just assumed like he'll bring the magic, like he knows better. He's the expert. But the reality is, who's the expert at how to sell our product? It was me. I knew exactly how to sell our product. And what I should have done is document it as a checklist and hand that over as part of onboarding to that salesperson. Now, that is what we do now. And here's the other great thing is by having done that, when we hire salespeople, I don't need to spend 60, 80, 100 grand a year on a a senior salesperson, I can bring in people who are just lovely, enthusiastic, clear communicators that are passionate about the, su the subject area, like developing people, and they can follow the processes and get amazing results. And guess what? They ch they cost less than half. <laughs> so, um, so uh, but that's an example of a fundamental failure that I made, an expensive failure. It, it's not like, oh, after a couple of weeks, we made the decision, I fired him. Like, it took months for us even to make a decision that it's like that it wasn't going to work. Like, and, and in theory, you could say, well, couldn't we have then fixed it in time? And maybe, and probably we tried, but then we got to a point where we ran, you know, cash flow was getting really tight. And so that cost me, you could look at it and say, okay, so maybe it cost me £50,000 worth of spend on him, but it's way more expensive than that. Because firstly, you've got all the like opportunity cost. If I'd done it right, Maybe he could have been doing a million pounds in, in revenue, or maybe not. Maybe it could have been, maybe it could have been 150,000, which is probably what I'd have been like at least aiming for. In which case, that's a hundred, like uh, over the course of that year, that would be a hundred thousand pounds in revenue on top of his, like of the cost of him that uh, we'd have then had. So, so easily that didn't cost me 50,000. It maybe cost me a hundred thousand. And then he said, well, actually, what happened as a result of that failure was, we weren't able to then go again and hire again for another 10, 11 months. So as a result, think about what that cost me. So arguably, that failure probably cost me nearly £200,000. It did, but but what, what the thing is, is you've, which I love, is you went, okay, what did we do? Because quite often in business, people go, and I've done it, I've employed someone, they're not done what I'm saying, oh, they're crap. And you look and you blame, 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 that's not the right person. Um, you know, if you, it's like uh, Nick James said this the other day, actually, he said, um, one of the worst things you can do when you go to um, the races for the first time is win. Because then you go, oh, I'm really good at this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it again. And like, if that guy'd come in, even though you know he could have been great for the first six months, and he could have got lucky, and it could have just made a few good calls and been in the right place, and then you've got, oh, this guy's great, and then you would have never have got to the point where you would have systemized and learnt that. So even though you've got that failure cost, actually you fell forward because you've looked at it and gone, okay, yeah. So rather than just me going. Blame, 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 blame. This was the wrong guy. He was maybe lied on his CV or all these other blame things that our brain does. You've gone, okay, why? And it's one thing I've learned is we've employed lots of people over the years and I've gone, why are they not performing? 
oh, like we had a sales guy, exactly the same situation come in last year. It was as I was exiting my business and I needed to replace me as I've got a manager and a, and a sales guy. I had a weekly call with him and that was it. I, I gave him a list of things, go, go, go and make some sales. Now I realise we need a process, we need a system, we need everything in place and we're now building that system and I've not employed since we let him go last September and I'm still sort of like getting by now, but exactly the same position. You know, otherwise you just keep, you just keep it employing people going, oh, he's not working, he's not working, he's not working. Yeah, and uh, we, we say attack the process, not the person, right? Like there are so many cases where business leaders go, oh, yeah, it's, it's you know, it's Tim. Tim's not up to scratch and uh, he's, he's not uh, achieving the targets. And the problem is as soon as you go, Tim, like this isn't acceptable, mate, da, 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 da. It's like you're taking away all of your power and putting it straight with them and giving that with a big dose of um frankly, shit that, 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 that they don't want to have to eat. And as a result, they're not going to, um, they're not going to help you uh, solve the problem as easily. Whereas if you take it and say, well, actually, this is, uh, let me assume that this is a process problem, not a people problem. Let me assume that it's not Tim wanting to do a bad job. He wants to do a good job. Like in general, people want to do a good job. The issue is more likely either we haven't provided Tim with the onboarding, the processes and so on to be successful or that the guidance that we've provided is insufficient or not good enough, like we've got a sales process that doesn't actually convert that well, so I need to make sure that that's not the answer. Or let's say that all of that was great and Tim's the only salesperson that's struggling, whatever. Last case, uh, you know, worst case scenario or last, last op um, option is maybe our recruitment process is the problem. The fact that we've hired Tim and he's not the right fit or hasn't got the right values fit, or hasn't got the skills or whatever, like maybe that's the problem. And by looking at it that way, you keep all you're empowered to solve the problem. You can look at where in your business is causing that problem. And here's the brilliant thing. Firstly, it means that you create, you become a better manager automatically because you're not jumping down people's throats every time anyone makes a mistake because you're always looking at the process first, not the person. But secondly, it means that you're consistently making changes and making setting up systems and building things in your business that means that you don't repeat those mistakes. Whereas if you make it a person problem where it's like, oh, they forgot to do something or they just you just need to tell them more forcefully, what's to stop them forgetting next time? Or you bring someone else in and they make the same mistakes. And so that's what I love about yeah, attacking the, the process, not the person, gives you a much of a more effective way and means that, as you say, you don't just uh, hire person after person assuming that it's them. <laughs> not you. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely love that. Uh, and that you've just put that out in the perfect way. And it's like what I always say, when you get over failure, you've got to look within before you look out. And we are where we are because of the decisions we've made. And if we blamed everybody else, then we'd never be empowered to move forward with our lives. And it's very easy to, to just go, oh, yeah, yeah, people, 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 people. But actually, like every issue in a business is a leadership issue. You know, it all comes back, you know, it's going back to health and safety. Every time someone's injured at work, it's it's never the guy's fault. It's the it's the direct director's fault because he's he's making those decisions come down and if you look at it like that with health and safety but then every other thing that happens in a business it is down to the person or the people the leadership team of where we are where we are so yeah you've definitely failed forward yes you had the cost and all that stuff but you actually probably in time wise nip that in a butt in the bud quite quickly rather than you could have been three years down employing in the cash flow and you know potential business loss because you've not worked that out and you were just blaming the sales guy oh another shit sales guy oh another crap sales guy oh we need to employ again so so yeah i think you've done really well to um to fail forward in true fail forward fashion <laughs> well indeed and, and as i say like you know we say you know, it probably cost me two hundred thousand two hundred fifty thousand. um good news i'm confident i've got that return on investment back like it's yeah, because exactly as you say, it's the failing forward is is me learning from that and applying it in my my businesses and then also using that those lessons learned to mean that we've been able to help other businesses to to do a better job of it, too. So, yeah, 100 uh, percent like using using those most painful lesson learns has been really powerful, I think, for two reasons as well. One is. Um, I think it's in the like in the book, The Obstacle is the Way. It's like often that bottleneck, that biggest failure that you have in your business, it's not just that it's not just that big symptomatic failure that exists. Like that's a symptom, right? So if you've got, let's say that you have a health and safety uh, uh, problem, someone accidentally like cuts their leg or whatever, like 
the that problem is not just oh that's the problem in its own right it's like that's a symptom of a wider set of issues like the the issue with my uh, sales guy like the fact that he couldn't deliver if let's say he had like exactly to say like uh, with Nick James like if you go to the races and you win let's say that by magic he had basically been successful but every other hire I'd done I'd done in exactly the same way and failed I would have like I, I a best case scenario I'd have just ended up with a load of inefficiency in the business which I might not spot worst case scenario I'd forever hold him up as being an example of how I absolutely can make this business successful in the way that I'm doing it and it's all these other salespeople that just aren't good enough rather than realizing that actually no I do need to provide the guidance and therefore since then I've had many salespeople in my organizations and been able to consistently get the results but I couldn't have done it if I hadn't had that failure and I think that's really important like I mean you know obviously you preach it as part of this podcast is looking for where are those failures to not just fix them and learn from them but actually almost use them as the 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 dashboard the warning lights to tell you there's probably something deeper there systematic systemically in your business that is causing those sorts of problems and if you can fix that not only will it stop those problems recurring, it'll probably remove a massive bottleneck to your business growth and help things be less stressful and help you achieve greater heights and so on, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, absolutely love that. We we in my tree surgery business, we do a quarterly staff survey, which is completely anonymous. And we ask the same five questions every time, one to five, agree, strongly agree, like how are you, do you have all the right tools for your job and stuff? And then there's a comments box at the end of it. And every every quarter I have to sit down because there's lots of stuff that's said. And I'm, I have to remember I'm asking these questions. And the last one, there was a lot of a lot of stuff coming out, you know, no, the staff's mouths. And at, the, at first instant, you want to go, oh, but you want to blame, blame, blame. But then, And then you look at it. And actually, there was a lot of surface stuff when you actually look at it and you go, OK, there's a lot of surface stuff, but what's really going on? What's behind here and what's creating this? And you start peeling away the, the layers and realizing, OK, well, you know, there's a few actually other things going on and you can work you can work with it. And I think, like you say, it's really important to be peeling away the different bits and working out what's going on behind there. So, yeah, I mean, I didn't realize we were going to go to these places so so quickly in this podcast of, of, of the fail forward, but it's really great insights and um, really shows. And then off the back of this, so you've you've kind of failed forward and realized how much systemization through these mini failures have happened. And I guess that's where Air Manual comes in. It is, yeah, because one thing was just that I would speak to other business owners and they'd say, oh, I love the, the I love the fact that you've set up Spider Gap, you know, it's, it's grown and so on, but also you're not required day to day in that business. Like you've got to a point where the team are able to do things and both myself and my co-founder are able to take like four weeks plus out of the business on holiday at the same time and it's fine and we take holidays and we don't get disrupted and we don't need to take the laptops and all that kind of stuff and note that again failing forward that that whole situation is because we made catastrophic uh, catastrophic mistakes in the past that in my case nearly resulted in the end of my relationship with my soulmate that fortunately we're now married have been 10 years but um uh, there was a point in our life where my work-life balance was uh, not healthy and nearly resulted in her uh, kicking me out um but by learning from that we said okay we need to set this up so i've been you know big on how to put that into the business and systemization has been a huge part of how we've achieved that but i would talk to other business owners and say so how do i do this alexis and i go oh, the problem is i can give you the like the structure but the patchwork of sticky tape and string that you'd have to use to try and create it meant that it wasn't going to work for most people's organizations and so even though we have been using tools like you know google docs and your loom videos and your process tree and asana and all these sorts of tools we'd found that they became a mess people didn't keep them up to date people didn't find it easy to find the process or follow it and then miss steps and make mistakes and so there were various things that we had kind of done around that to make that work but when i was T you know telling my friends like oh this is you know yeah you, you can do it like this i knew i could see like oh, it's not going to work for them unless because they're not going to do x and y and so so um, you basically bodged it together with using different systems and it worked as you say it worked for you guys because you'd you'd done it but that wasn't a transferable thing to somebody else Exactly. And train, you know, with, with the workarounds included how we would trained the team and also the nature of the team we'd got, you know, we'd, we're a software business. As a result, we have fairly techie people that could cope with the fact that you have to go, oh, but you have to go here and then did this. And like, 
those things when I then like I've got a friend who runs a training business and when he's trying to set that up for his wife who kind of does the admin and this other salesperson who's uh, a bit more old school like it's not going to work for him so that was always a sort of source of frustration for me because my background was sorting out processes for businesses you know we'd systemize our own business and yet I couldn't help you know my friends not only get this in their business, oh, that's great, and improve your business performance. But fundamentally, what we're talking about, we're talking about not having to work weekends, being able to take proper holidays, spending time with the people that you love, not being constantly stressed out by firefighting in the business, being able to actually grow the business and be able to hire and train people without worrying about how that's going to derail you from other things, like losing tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of pounds to mistakes. Those are not little problems that I could just like wave off as like, oh, well, I can't help my friends with these like friends and family members with these things. And so, um, yeah, for quite a while, myself and Paddy were kind of looking at that problem and saying, well, what would it look like if we could solve it? And honestly, I think initially we hadn't entertained the idea of, oh, let's go create another software business. Um, because you know things were going well at Spider Gap, but um, yeah, when when I had a conversation with Paddy and he showed me some uh, designs that he put together and said, oh, I was thinking this, I was like, oh, I am all in this. I totally want to solve this problem. <laughs> and so through iterating, working with business owners and leaders, um, we iterated and developed a really kind of easy to use tool that makes it possible for you to give to the teams uh, the guidance that they need so that they can perform the, the processes, the step-by-step -step checklist, the, the onboarding, so that you can delegate more effectively. Um, but, um, and so that's been awesome. Like, I love what we've created there, and it means that I have now been able to help multiple uh, businesses, friends, family, and many others um, to, to free up hundreds of hours, thousands of hours of their time and stop the repeated mistakes and get people onboarded in days rather than months and, and so on. Um, what's inter what was interesting, talking about, you know, fell forward again, like when we got the product to a point where I was showing it to business owners and they're going, oh, ooh, this is exactly what I need. Set me up an account. What was really interesting is that in many cases they would be set up with the account and then two, four weeks later I'd check in and I could see they'd done nothing. And it's not like, oh, the tool is difficult, like the tool is easy to use and so on but they hadn't even had the time to go and do something. And what I realized is that part of the problem is the friction of the tools and so on, but part of it is the approach and, the, and having the confidence that a small amount of time invested will get a quick return. Because the problem is that the thing that all of our clients have got in common is they're busy, <laughs> right? That, that, they, they're all short on time and so it's you know it's it's funny slash frustrating whenever we have a call with someone that they say oh i'm really sorry i'm gonna have to reschedule we're just really busy at the moment and it's like yep that's that's why we're having the call with you to help you free up your time um and and to kind of illustrate like why that's such a frustration so i was working with this uh this owner of a printing business and um, and in fact, the call that uh, I had with him had been rescheduled a couple of times because because he'd been busy, right? And um, I talked to him, and he was he was struggling. Like he was working sixty hour weeks. Uh, he felt completely unable to work on the business rather than in it, uh, rather than you know spending all of his time working in it. And worse, he couldn't even see where to start to free up the time. So I said, well, you know, where are you currently spending your time? And he said, well you know, we identified a few tasks and one of them is spending three hours per day. So that's 15 hours per week um, doing price quotes for customers. So a customer says, hey, I need a quote for doing this. In his case, print jobs, but for whoever it is, you know, chopping these trees, whatever it is, right? Every business has got some form of this. And he said, I'm doing three hours a day responding to these requests for quotes. So we picked that and I said, well, okay, like that seems an area that you're going to need to delegate. And he goes, I know, Alexis, I know, I know I'm meant to delegate it, but I've just not found the time. Um, and he said, I figure it would probably take me about eight hours to even just get it documented. Now, of course, if that were the case, if it took him eight hours to document it, seven hours to train his team, that would still be worth it after one week because he'd get 15 hours back every week after that point. But I said, well, we've got 45 minutes left of this call. Let's see what we can do. And in 30 minutes, we got the entire process documented as a checklist. And then we arranged a call with his account managers for the following week and then got them to follow through the checklist and test it. And there were questions that they had and so on. And we made tweaks to the process live while they're going through it. 
so that they get to get to a point that they could reliably create a good quote and that had a review step so that someone senior in the team would have a quick look. Um, but as a result, like within those two sessions, he was able to free up 15 hours per week. That's 780 hours per year by handing over one process. And the really cool thing from this, so, I mean, yes, it's great that a couple of hours saved him 780 hours a year. Uh, and boy, do I bet he wishes that he had scheduled that call and actually had it the week before, like rather than, like, oh, I'm too busy. It's like, oh, yeah, that cost you about 60 hours by delaying it by four weeks. Um, uh, so that's really cool. But here's another really uh, a couple of awesome things. So one is, um, I, you know, I said to him, oh, what's the most impactful thing? Like we do, we do an impact review uh, with our customers to like make sure uh, we've had an impact because our number one core value is focus on impact. I said, one of our questions is like, what's been the biggest impact? And I said, like, presumably it's the saved time. And he went, no. I said, what? And he said, no. Conversions. I said, what do you mean conversions? He said, well, previously it used to take me two to three days to respond to a request for a quote. Now it takes my account managers about an hour. Now imagine what that means. Like if you send a request for quotes from two printing businesses, one comes back in three days and one comes back in an hour, which one are you going to end up going with? So, exactly. So as a result, like he increased his conversion rate and freed up all of his time. And then of course, also through doing that, learned how he could be delegating more activities and repeated that cycle over and over for the next nine months and removed himself completely day to day from the business. So that now he's either, you know, he can either be on the golf course or whatever, or in his case, working on the business, but not 60 hour weeks. He can work it like normal working hours. And as a result, he gets to spend time with wife and kids and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's the key to, <laughs> to success in this area is um, it's about being, making sure that you're not putting this stuff off just because you're busy. You, a small amount of time invested can get an incredible um, result back. And that's what I love about what we created with Air Manual was not just the, the product and the tool that makes that removes the friction, because that's really what the tool is doing um, at, a, at its heart. There's some really cool stuff that we've developed recently and is coming that um, adds a load more. But the other bit is the approach. It's how do you delegate this stuff? How do you stop the repeated mistakes? How do you make sure that you're not then having to micromanage? And that's what we've, uh, we kind of developed by working with, uh, with a load of businesses across loads of different industries, service providers, manufacturing, construction, membership, so, you know, the, the lot to, to create a model that, that really works. And, you know, I now run regular webinars that essentially cover it. And you've seen me talk at events about the uh, kind of approach that, that we would take. So um, yeah, it's uh, what I love most is the the fact that this stuff is life changing. You know, when you when you're changing someone's life from being their day to day, their week from being stressed out, working all hours, impacting health, impact relationships to actually like you remove all of that. And instead, they're spending time on the things that matter most. It's just magical. Yeah, absolutely love that. And and you're right, because money money doesn't like friction, it likes speed. It's why Amazon's done so well, because it's just like one touch by. And if people are getting those quotes quicker, if people are getting things through quicker, if that you know, that people don't see that with systems, yes, you 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 sell it for the for the time basis, but there's so many other benefits in there. And I'm as you're talking, I'm thinking about my tree surgery business and Sophie, who's my office manager, we're always talking about systemization. She's done some process maps and stuff, but it's always the thing that gets left till last because the thing that generally gets done first is serve customer, you know, get the sales done, get that in. And then the last thing comes systems. Oh, when I get some time, I'll do, I'll, I'll continue with our systemization project, not really thinking about it, that that's the thing that's going to help it all come together. So we've got more time and we're not having to go and employ more people in the office. We're not having to employ more people because we need more people, more hours, because we've not got the systems and process in place. So um, there's so many other costs, you know, if you get the systemization, we might not have to go and employ another person. That's going to save money. That means more, more time. You know, there's, there's so many benefits from it and um currently one of the challenges that we've got and we talked about this when we met last is that we write a process map on a check sheet and then it goes and sits in a folder and it's quite rigid sometimes isn't it systemization so what does air manual do to help you know make it a bit more fluid yeah so that you know it's a bit like when i said we're all about removing the friction and so it's a bit like the process map, it's still a bit pro like documenting the process, process maps at the end and it's an afterthought and it goes in a folder. That's often what people think of when they think about documenting their processes in a business. And that's what I used to do as a consultant, right? I'd go into these businesses and I'd document these process maps and then we'd laminate them and stick them on a wall. 
And the problem is that the walls behind the team member, so they're not following or using the process when they do the job. And also, if they make a mistake or ask a question or whatever, we'll answer it, but we don't update that laminated on the wall and so on. And it's not used as part of training because it's complex and like, you know, difficult to follow and so on. And so all of that just doesn't lend itself well to giving your team the guidance they need to succeed, right? And yet that's what this is all about. And so the realization, I guess at its core, was how you can simplify all of that by using checklists rather than making it too complex using process maps. Because I used to create these process flows in PowerPoint and these box goes goes here and da 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 da. And then I try and train the team and it gets lost or you know, they're like they they can't quite follow it, or they do follow it, but then if they want to make a change to the process, it's complex to do so, so it has to come back to me to make a change. And instead what we did with uh, what we found worked for us and then we kind of built as the foundation of Air Manual is interactive checklists. Is the fact that for any action in your business, let's say sending an invoice, you can create a checklist with a series of steps of how do you send an invoice in your business? How do you get the right customer details and put it into the accounting system in the right way and the right account codes and whatever? And how is it sent to the customer? What's the template email? You can put that as a an interactive checklist that with with Air Manual, we've made it so that it's fast, as fast to go through it. In fact, faster to go through it and follow up on the checklist than if you did without it. And so that's really powerful because now you're able to make sure that anyone who is sending an invoice, running a sales call, uh, sending a quote, you know, whatever, whatever action in your business, they're able to follow a checklist and actually interact with it and tick it off as they go along and even capture data where appropriate. Uh, and we've also added automations as well to kind of link into other systems, which means that it's faster to follow with like using the process part from the house because it's prompting you all the way through um to get stuff done but also you're doing it the right way every time because you're following those steps and what's even better is when you identify an opportunity for improvement so for example let's say that as part of a sales call we identify perhaps we've attended some sales training perhaps from a um uh, a friend and a mentor to both of us like uh, matthew elwell for example we might say oh yeah i've, I've learned this great uh, tip on um when you're basically looking to close the sale rather than say okay you know are you sold are you happy to go ahead which is a stunted part of the sales process makes it a bit hard instead ask a question that doesn't have that energy in it like um, would you prefer debit or credit card or would you prefer to go monthly or annual or where should i send the invoice or whatever it's like oh those are brilliant questions that make the sales call much more relaxed. Like you put that in that part of the checklist, like you put that in the sales checklist that you've got, like how to run a discovery call and you've got the, okay, once you've done this, once they've like asked them, uh, like confirm that this is the right fit for them and then ask them, okay, where should I send the invoice? And that's how you close it. And I've, I did a, an episode of um, my podcast, I know it's like episode 58 of De-Stress Your Business, where I talked about changes that we'd made in our sales process like this and how it had um, increased our conversion rate 4x and it reduced the amount of time to do a sale by half and the elapsed time by uh, by half as well, uh, uh, by 50% as well. And that's huge, right? That's basically like a 16 times improvement on my revenue to time spent in sales by making those improvements in the detail of how it's done. But that wouldn't have worked if I just updated it in a process chart and put it off in a folder somewhere. It only worked because my team changed how their behavior and followed that that process and, and did those things differently. And equally, if results had got worse, I'd have been able to go back <laughs> to a previous version and and, uh, uh, and do that instead. But it's like, that's the real power of when you when you do this and, and you know, why we use Air Manual for, for this rather than other tools is because you've got to you've got to remove that friction, you've got to make it possible that you can document the stuff as you're doing it and as part of designing how you're going to do it rather than it be a big admin task that you've got to do at the end you've got to make it so frictionless when you identify an idea an opportunity for improvement you've got to be able to just go ah oh, there we go update the tweak publish and now everyone does it that new way rather than it being a to-do that sits on your priority list that's never going to get done for the next six months you've got to make it possible that your team can find the process and follow it faster than having to work it out themselves you know, if, it, if you can't set a realistic expectation that they can find the process and how to do stuff, then how can you possibly hold them to task if they get things wrong? If they say, oh, yeah, I've sent the invoice. If you go, oh, look, you sent the invoice, but you didn't put the right VAT rate on, and they go, I'm really sorry. And you say, did you follow the process? 
if it is a reasonable response, they go, oh, I didn't know we had one or I couldn't find it, then you're already failing, right? Like you're not going to be able to improve that. Whereas when you've got everything in one place and it's like, that would be a weird thing to say with their manual customers. Like, like if you said to a member of your team, like, did you follow the post? And they go, I didn't know where to find it. It's like, it's in manual, it's in the, it's in your team folder. Yeah, you're assigned to it. Like type, type in invoice. Oh, there it is. Like though that like for our customers that's not a thing and so that makes a huge difference so, you know so that's i could go on but those, those are some of the things that we had to overcome really that we had to overcome when we when we created air manual to, to help people solve this problem cool i absolutely love that and i love the sound of air manual and i'm really looking forward to getting stuck into it for me my mind isn't um very systemization i'm more of i'm a high eye if you know disc profiling so i'm like a starter i'm not a great finisher so this excites me but it also scares the shit out of me because I'm like, how how do I like make that work? And it sounds really good. And I've got someone like Sophie in my office who's a completer finisher. And I have to surround myself with completer finishers because I'm a I'm a starter kind of guy and an ideas person. But I'm sure there's lots of people listening to this and they're like, I don't even know where to start with systemization. Like, and I'm a small business or I've got a big business and I'm and this this whole thing daunts me. How can you and your team help somebody who's sat there going, I don't even know how to put one step in front of the other? Yeah, so I'd, I'd say if uh, if there's someone thinking, uh, you know, like in your situation where you're excited to get started, you you want to essentially have your hand held and and like shown like this is what you're going to do um, by people who are completer finishers because uh, I'm I'm more the high eye like you know I like starting stuff, but my team <laughs> my team are completer finishers and they are all like the number of times when um, uh, a client of mine, particularly one that knows me well, has had has had a like workshop with uh, one of my consultants. And of course, because they know me, their initial thing is like, oh, you know, perhaps Alexis, you can do this. And it's like, then they have the experience of working with Microsoft. They're like, no, no, no I want them because <laughs> they make sure it's like they're <laughs> really organized. And of course, that's what you want. You want either people in your own team or people in mine that are holding it to task and moving it forward. And one of my favorite things is we get stuff done on the calls, like rather than like, oh, yeah, here's a load of homework for you. No one likes homework. I prefer to just get stuff done on conversations with people and so that's that's a common uh, approach that we use so uh, for those sorts of people uh, arrange a call with the team airmanual.link forward slash discovery to arrange a discovery call to uh, get a workspace set up and uh, explore air manual see if it's a good fit for your needs if it is uh, you can uh, you can learn more about how we can work together if you're the sort of person that wants to do a bit more research first and understand, you know, but what are the steps? How how would uh, how would this actually work in my business? How what are the kinds of problems that you'd solve, and exactly how would that work? And and what are the options to work with AirManual? Um, then we've got a, a, a essentially a brochure um, which you can get at airmanual.link forward slash discover, which kind of covers all of that in in detail. Um, and then alternatively, if you're kind of thinking actually. Um, I, I want to learn some of the more of the concept stuff first and learn a bit more about this approach and uh, how I can use it for onboarding and how do I sort out the management and so on. You prefer to perhaps attend like a workshop. Uh, I run a, a regular webinar at um, airmanual.co forward slash webinar where people can kind of join on that. Um, and then, of course, we've got the De-Stress Your Business podcast where uh, people can hear about us talk about all sorts of things, whether it's uh, improving cash flow is a topic that we're we're uh, doing a load of episodes on at the moment. In the past, we've done onboarding, we've done recruitment, done AI as well. We wrote um, I was going to ask about um, AI. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, like we wrote um, a guide for business leaders on using AI and and chat with GPT, which um, has had amazing feedback. By the way, like there was um, someone that uh, was at the uh, event that we were at uh, together a few weeks ago, uh, who said to me that they read they read the guide. And then there was a task that they'd been putting off for a while because they knew it would take them like five hours. And so they used what they'd learned from following like the checklist in our guide. And as a result, it took them 30 minutes. And it's just like, awesome. It's like, yeah, brilliant. You spent like 15 minutes reading a guide and as a result, say four and a half hours. Like, yep, that's the kind of results I like. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, that one is available at airmanual.link forward slash AI forward slash ebook. So there's various resources that people can use to kind of check out uh, what we're doing, learn more, uh, and uh, yeah, people can connect uh, connect to me on social media as well, Alexis Kingsbury, uh, to to hear more about what we're doing, and yeah, ask any questions that people have got. Yeah, and I'll put all the links in the show notes so people can come and click and and have a check out and everything. Um, just we've got a few more minutes left before we wrap up. We mentioned AI there. 
and you know a lot of n normal people will be going oh ai terminator's coming it's the world's going to end skynet all that kind of stuff people, yeah <laughs> yeah yeah um and you know like the people who are looking at these opportunities and you know got their business brain on like how powerful is it like how much is it going to revolutionize business and what's it going to do for us yeah so um yeah, I go deep on some of this in some of the episodes, but um, there's a particular episode I did uh, on de-stress your business around like how to get how to uh, remove the stress and get ahead of the disruption in the AI. And I remember in that episode saying that every single industry, every business, and in every industry is going to be impacted by AI in some way in the coming months and years. Um, and I stand by that. I've been doing a lot of research on it, and I'm yet to find a business that's not going to be impacted or could benefit um, from it. There's there's so much we could cover on this, but the um, the areas that I think uh, that most business leaders need to get their heads around are that firstly, uh, your product or service, the the nature of its value uh, is likely to change in relation to AI in terms of what people can get in terms of guidance, support, resources, etc. That is going to change, and so you need to look into uh, and understand what could happen, um, both in terms of what could your competitors do, um, but also therefore where's the opportunities for you. I, you know, I've looked across all of my businesses and I've had sessions with my executive teams to go, okay how can how could we use ai to add more value to our customers solve the biggest problems that they have right now using what we can do in ai um there's a nice example actually that i can that i can use um is that we found a particular um uh, problem that customers have that i could get a software engineer to develop some code that would kind of help them but we worked out it was probably take about two three weeks of of a software developer working on that problem to solve this problem and then we worked out with ai that it was probably something we could solve in an afternoon and it's that kind of order of magnitude kind of impact that you can have not just in coding not just in content but every single area of your business i've i've spoken to lawyers and training businesses and bricks and mortar businesses and shown them countless examples of where this is absolutely game changing in terms of value to deliver so that's one area another area is in terms of your business efficiency like i've you know shared an example where someone uh, took a task that would normally take them five hours and did it in half an hour. Yesterday, I basically collaborated with ChatGPT for most of the day to write a quite a complex document and worked in collaboration back and forth to get something that would probably have normally taken me four days, and I got it uh, drafted in less than a day. Um, there are so many opportunities for um, efficiency, both for one-off tasks like that, but also building into your processes. So um, you may remember the presentation that I gave uh, back at Expert Empires. I talked about how using a tool like Descript for podcasts, you know, where I'm on now, you can use that in so many ways to make editing faster and to make it uh, much faster for you to create um, uh, small bits of promotional content that you can uh, share with your guests. That means that they can promote it and achieve all your goals. Like all of this stuff that previously would have cost you thousands of pounds or days of your time or, or hiring people you can get done far more efficiently um, using various ai uh, and then finally I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just just quickly on that i'm just debating using well not debating it's been an idea since i began the podcast is to use my solo episodes as the sort of chapters of my book and getting it to getting it to just you know descript de it and just turn that into the chapters. It might have to bring, I have to bulk it out, but I'm not a strong writer. So, you know, ChatGPT is amazing. I can talk to you for hours, but putting it into sentences and making it sound good is a completely different thing. So it'd be really interesting to see how that works. Yeah, whereas a model like ChatGPT4 in you know, a, a language model is able to write pretty well. Um, and as a result, you know, it has to be a collaborative back and back and forth exercise. And there's various ways that you can improve the kind of result that you get, particularly by using that style of thinking, like treating it as a as an employee you're working with, not not something you just chuck it in and get an outcome. Like it has to be collaborative. But when you do that, absolutely, it, it would help you get the lion's share of a of a manuscript done um, before you then perhaps consider like human editors and all that kind of stuff to, to help you get it really singing. Um, so yeah, I think that's those are loads of examples. Um, so that's that's kind of like the value that your business provides, the efficiency of it. And then finally, the competitive marketplace is going to change. You know, where people are looking for products and services is shifting already um and you know with t tip of the iceberg it's it's it will be disrupted you know whether whether or not google 
um, it becomes no longer the king is up for question, which, I mean, that is crazy even now, like to most of us who have just got used to saying Google it. The fact that that is at risk is interesting. But also, even if King does, even if Google doesn't get taken from its King position for search, um, it, the nature of its search is likely to change in terms of how it's using uh, AI uh, to uh, serve up search results and so on. That will change what it means for you in terms of your how you reach your customers organically through paid and all these sorts of things. Like your ability to be out there in terms of social media, um, the ability for others to create content, either using content that you or others put out or just their own, and absolutely flood the market with more messaging that you can if they use AI correct, correctly is huge and so as a result changes the competitive landscape. There's um, so many ways and in fact also your competitors providing alternative services by leveraging AI so that it means that your product or services becomes not as valuable or less required or whatever. Like There's so many ways in which AI could be used to, to, make pra to have a practical impact on your business. Um, as I say, I highly recommend people check out the, the ebook to kind of cover that in a way that feels more uh, practical and uh, and helps them do it in a way that's not so scary, but also doesn't result in like a long derail where you spend the next three days, you know, on YouTube <laughs> watching video after video, uh, which I've done. Um, uh, and I've done so you don't have to. Uh, instead, uh, you can like read a 15 minute ebook and there's also a training checklist in there that you can use for you and your teams to kind of learn about this kind of stuff. Because yeah, I mean, as 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 you know, right, Henry, it's like it's a complex area and it's changing every day. Like that's the, the other thing we know, like there are new tools every single day. There are limitations that will get talked about last month that won't exist next month. And so it's constantly changing. And so you've got to have a basic level of understanding and curiosity and playfulness with this. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, mm. yeah, you can embrace really it. Like embrace it and i think actually this will be perfect for us to do another podcast episode in the coming months and we can do one about ai right yeah um, be up for that sounds a, good there's a there's a lot to talk about so i've now um i've now added a question which i'm going to ask every single person at the end of the podcast and you are the first person um it's quite a simple question i hope it goes well would... otherwise you won't ask it again <laughs> no exactly <laughs> What you what do you know now that you'd really, really want to tell your younger self if you're starting all over again? What is the piece of advice that you'd tell your younger self? It's an interesting one because, of course, earlier we've been talking about failing forward and how you kind of kneel, need those failures so that you can learn. So I think there's so many mistakes I'd still want my younger self to make so that it could learn the things it has. But the one thing that I'd probably say is um, play bigger. I think the the thing that I've probably held myself back on is that because I've wanted to make sure that um, the results from my effort are uh, successful, that I get some return on the investment of effort, that as a result, I kind of perhaps played smaller than I needed to. And so if anything, I end up surprised that everything went so well, but it's almost like if I played bigger, I could have got yeah, not quite the volume of results, but a bigger return. Um, and so I think that that's probably something I've come to later is, yeah, setting my sights higher in terms of the impact that I that I can have. So that would probably be the, the thing I'd try and teach my younger, younger self. I know that my younger self wouldn't have listened. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that guy was a dick. Uh, yeah, he, yeah. <laughs> how I feel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he, he probably would have said I am. I, I am and uh, and would have ignored me. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's that's on that's it. But that's, you know, we're not going to attack the person. We're going to attack the process. We're going to say that's on me. <laughs> I need a, a better a better way of helping my younger self embrace uh, thinking big. Uh absolutely love that and i think you know you talk about um the failure bit and, and that you needed to go through those one of my biggest things is that i would have failed faster because it took me 10 years to fail originally and if i'd have failed faster i would have got to where i wanted to get to quicker but i was so scared of it at the time i didn't really appreciate it so getting that those faster faster failures in place would have got me to where i wanted to get to quicker but i love that thinking big because sometimes we do think a lot of people will think smaller and if we thought bigger you know we might it might have got gone faster and achieved more or failed faster to achieve more yeah and of course it, i suppose to some extent it's the other side of the same coin right is i'm saying play bigger um with an expectation of failing uh bigger and more often 
um, uh, with and 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 an expectation and an acceptance of that. Um, I think it's um, another uh, a, a guy that I had on my podcast, D Ludlow. I remember him sharing that. Um, I think it was his dad that had said, "If you want to increase your success rate, you need to double your failure rate." Like you need, you need exactly the as you say, like fail faster, accept that you're going to fail more, like do more, um, and put yourself out there, um, and yeah, you'll fail more, but you'll also succeed more. And if you, the bigger you play, the bigger you'll succeed as well. Absolutely love that. What a way to uh, what a way to end. So thanks so much for today. It's been an amazing podcast. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I think the moral is is to uh, you know systemize your business quicker. Um, you know get that done. It, you might think it's the um, thing that's you know last on the on the pile, but actually it's the thing that should be at the top because you're going to save more time. So if anybody wants to check Alexis out, we'll put his details in into the show notes. And uh, yeah, I think me and you definitely need to have a conversation about air mail. Air, air, manual and i need to introduce you to sophie fantastic yeah we'll do that then sounds good (laughs) cool thanks for coming on and uh yeah we'll look forward to seeing everyone in the next episode cheers thanks for having me